and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that has a strange way of stumbling into things. Case in point, several months ago now, I had just done the last archive thing on reel-to-reel -reel stuff, and I was out of supplies. Stupid, needy DBX system. So I logged on to good old Fleabay to look for some blank tapes and leader and splices and all that, and Fleabay's wonderfully reliable algorithm seemed to think I was looking for books, specifically books on home recording. And I guess their little algorithm worked because one of those books just looked too old and outdated and weird and not to mention was simply too cheap to pass up. So with that, today I'm going to run one of my little already completed pseudo documentaries in which this time out I learn the right way to tape record as of 1965. Even though I ordered this book from an American seller, as it turned out, this is a British book meant for British consumption. I have no idea how this thing found its way to this side of the Atlantic. But having said that, it's tape recording, so unless they're talking voltages, it doesn't really matter. It's the same worldwide. But anyway, the book in question, The Right Way to Tape Record, was first published in 1959 and revised in 1965, seemingly to account for the greater use of stereo decks by that point. And as today's episode title would strongly imply, this is the 65 version. Now, I can't find much of anything about the author, uh, one Lawrence Mallory, but he implies a few times throughout the book that he produced film strips, uh, you know, the kind they used to use in classrooms where you'd have the strip of film and you'd play the audio tape in tandem with it and you'd hear the beep and that'd be your cue to kick over to the next frame, the next shot, whatever. But anyway, uh, my instincts in picking up this book proved to be pretty much right. Uh, for one, this thing adheres to every old-school how-to book cliché, uh, right down to the flowery language and over-enthusiastic tone and occasionally condescending tone. But having said that, uh, when it comes right down to it, some of the recording styles and advice are still valid now and in varying degrees of use today while others are cheesy and silly and I don't think we're in any danger of ever catching on. So anyway, as you can see, I've marked several pages of this book, and those are the tips, tricks, and activities that I want to try out today. So we'll start out with the more practical ones, the less crazy ones, and then we'll get into the more outdated and outright silly ones. As always, when I'm dealing with old technology and old ideas, I like to try and keep things as period-appropriate as possible. So I have to admit that I'm taking some slight liberties here. None of my gear is from 1965 or earlier, but the technology was already there by 65. So, for example... The mic I intend to use, and I've actually got two of them, so we can do some stereo stuff too. Uh, I'm going to use a pair of Shure SM57s, dynamic mic, very common mic, used in pretty much every recording studio and live rig in the world. And these were introduced in 1965. My mics are probably from sometime in the 90s, maybe early 2000s. But, again, the technology was there, same design as what there was in 65. And as for my reel-to-reel -reel deck, it's four-track stereo open reel, but 
It's a TAC A3300SX, and those are from the mid-70s to early 80s. And my unit is from either 79 or 80. And, yeah, at least those things were introduced in, what, the first four trackers uh, would have been late 50s, maybe very early 60s, uh, you know, where it was kind of a precursor to the cassette. So even if it's not stuff that was there at the time, it was technology that existed and was in use by the end of 1965. All right, just a quick technical note here. When I do need to talk before an experiment, I'm kind of stuck using a lav mic, lavalier mic right now. So you'll hear some handling noises and all that, but I'm kind of short on things like mic stands for everything. So I'd like to keep everything earmarked for what I need it for. Anyway, the most simple basic test and one of the more ghetto ones is for people with a lot of sibilance in their speech, S sounds. And the way to control that is to have them not talk right into the mic, but about 10 to 15 degrees off axis. So that's what I'm going to try here. I've got the tape queued up. Uh, we're going to be running at seven and a half inches per second. And uh, pardon the noise while I hang this sucker up. All right, and I got level, good. All right, so I'm talking right into the mic, right on axis, right now. I'm sitting, oh, nine inches, I would imagine, less than a foot. So I'm one of those people that tends to have some S issues, as you can probably hear, so let's see how bad I can make it. Seven sickly sycophants were sailing for the shores of Surrey, and they all had scurvy. All right, I'm going to try that again if I remember that little spiel because I just made that up. Uh, I'm going to try it. Okay, now I'm s about 10 to 15 degrees off axis here. Let me try that again. Seven sickly sycophants were sailing for the shores of Surrey and they all had scurvy. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's wonderful. All right. All right, this is the big practical one, and this is one that was in use before the book, at the time of the book, today, tomorrow, forever and ever, amen, and that is proximity. And the whole idea is that the closer you get to the mic, the less of the room you hear, and you can kind of control a room that way. Of course, the trade-off is you have to control your voice, too, and try not to do as many uh, strong P's, plosives, mouth noises and all that and as such for this test i've put my little windscreen on the sm57 here uh yeah they had those in the 60s so anyway i think we all know how this test is going to do i mean i couldn't demo that right now just with this mic but we're here to talk tape so let's get this going All right, we're rolling. I'm sitting about six to nine inches away from the mic. There is no sound dampening in this room. The acoustics in here are absolutely terrible. Um, yeah, let's just get this one over with, and I guess I'm going to have to stick my face into the camera, aren't I? But I can also stick my hand into the camera. <laughs> Okay, so if I get right on top of the mic and I'm trying to talk right into it, I'm trying to control my voice, control my P's, and not uh, be too hot for the tape. I'm just working at a, a fairly nominal level, uh, about so, oh, right at 50%, so definitely uh, right in the zone there. 
All right, right on top of it. I am touching the windscreen, which I probably shouldn't do, and it probably sounds a little nasty. So I'll come back here, and you'll hear more of the room, and I'll take my creaky old office chair, roll back a bit, and you can really hear the room. So this is about three feet, and I have to raise my voice just so I can register on the VU meter. I obviously can see it right here. Yeah, this one's just common sense. All right, I just wanted you to get a quick look at this. I've already actually done this test, but since I still had everything out, I thought I'd show it off. Now, everything in the book on field recording means real field recordings. Taking your tape recorder out and doing stuff out in public. I guess I could do that with mine, but it's a little big, a little impractical. So the next best thing was to just open the windows and try and do a, a recording. And it's a nice day out. It's nice and sunny, lots of birds singing and all. And so what I did was I took my two SM57s, put them at about equal height, about equal distance, about the same angle, sticking straight out. And of course, I had the blinds and the windows open when I did this and just trying to get some of it. And aside from a little uh, electrical interference at one point, I was actually really impressed.
Okay, I'm genuinely hoping that you actually took the time to read that page just preceding this segment. If you didn't, you might want to go back and actually take the time to read it, because this won't make sense otherwise. But anyway, yes, we are going to do the world's most ghetto fade out and fade in on a tape. So the basic idea is this is meant more for people whose tape decks were so cheap that they didn't have a master volume control for the input. Well, obviously this does, but I really don't like the idea of taking a big nasty magnet, uh, alas, not a horseshoe magnet, I don't have one of those, but a big magnet nonetheless, and getting near all this stuff. That just doesn't sound like a good idea to me. So I'd like to do this elsewhere, but there's one little problem. There's a bunch of extra stuff underneath here that keeps me from just taking a tape off in the middle of the program. So what I've done here is I've taken one of my old songs, dubbed it onto this old Junker reel-to-reel, and it's kind of a blessing in a way to allow me to do this. I'm going to cut the tape, and I'm going to splice in oh, a foot or two of leader. And this will give me a nice line of demarcation. So what it will allow me to do is the closer you get with the magnet, the more the sound cuts out. So it'll allow me a chance to do a nice fade out going into the leader and then attempt the fade in coming out of the leader. And I'll have that nice little space. But anyway... Let's take a cut here to take a cut. All right, this is one of those old, supposedly tried-and-true home remedies, and that is to obscure the erase head so you can overdub onto a, a recording without having real multi-track gear. Now, this is one that even I knew about growing up back in the 90s, although it was cassettes, not reel-to-reel. -reel. And the couple of times I tried it, I never had any luck, and by the time I actually started trying to make music on my own, uh, I'd long since given up on that idea. But as for this, well, I can overdub to a point. I, I it just naturally I can do two channels, left and right. But beyond that, I'm going to record over whatever is already there. But I'm not anticipating this thing actually working. Now, the book says I can use either old camera film or glossy magazine paper stock, and I don't have any old camera film that I'm okay with cutting up, so this is going to be my next best option. Now, one shortcoming of this deck is that I can't hear myself. I can't monitor myself when I'm recording over so what I'm going to have to do is just disorganized sounds. So I'm just going to make random stupid sounds into my two mics here. I've got a left channel here. You can probably see that on the VU meter. And the right 
channel. And then I'll just add some random stupid stuff onto that and we'll see if it gets us anywhere. Some time ago, I wanted to make a documentary about a day's trip to the Farn Islands, a bird sanctuary some three miles off the Northumbrian coast. I took the early boat out with my machine slung over one shoulder. Difficulties soon appeared. Being one of the last to enter a rather full boat, I had to sit on the hatch cover of the engine. This constant and noisy background made recording possible only when the motor was throttled back. Whoop-dee-doo. It is not necessary to have a portable tape recorder, and by this we mean a machine independent of mains power supply to make location recordings, but there are drawbacks to using a standard recorder for this type of work. And on and on and so it goes and so it goes. It is not necessary to have a portable tape recorder, and by this we mean a machine independent of mains power supply to make location recordings, but there are drawbacks to using a standard recorder for this type of work. And on and on and so it goes and so it goes. Cover of the engine. This constant and noisy background made recording possible only when the motor was throttled back. Left, right, good, okay. Some time ago, I wanted to make a documentary about a day's trip to the Farn Islands. Believe it or not, in all my years of dinking around with tapes, I have never had a reason or just even the thought to make a tape loop. And since it's referenced in the book, as you just saw, no time like the present. Now, my calculations, which are rough at best, say it would take about three feet of tape with the reels on here to get around uh, this whole circuit. And I am not going to try anything musical here because I'm sure I would totally miscalculate the rhythm and it would be completely offbeat when you'd hit the splice uh, that joins it all together. But anyway, I have a uh, junker tape that I've bulk erased just for the occasion. So I got plenty of tape. I got some splices and, eh, well, maybe it'll be at least sort of amusing. Okay, here we go. Hopefully that's enough tension.
He's not one. Look at the gal. That crowd must have been hunting him. Call the parson over, or Father Skelton. One of you. Keep a sharp lookout now. It was a babble of voices, and like a dream, I sat down, staring stupidly and holding Betty against my heart until I realized a man was pulling at my knees and talking insistently. I began to wake up then, and looking down, recognized the minister I had seen the previous day. I could not remember his name, but I handed Betty down to him when he asked, as obediently as a child. All right, pardon the noise in the background. It's really hot and humid out today, so I just had to turn on the air conditioning. I just couldn't stand it anymore. But anyway, there's one more experiment I'd like to tackle today, and it has nothing to do with the book, nothing to do with 1965. It's just that it involves a reel-to-reel -reel deck, and since I've already got all that stuff out, you know, I might as well go for it. So, personal story time here. Back when I was a teenager, I developed this kind of weird taste for guitar pedal effects. And there's the guitar. Uh, one of them. I, I actually used a Stratocaster, but I'm going to use my favorite guitar for this one. But anyway, um, I got, uh, it's not in this lot, but I got a digital delay pedal somewhere down the line. And so I was able to create feedbacky stuff and loops and, uh, you know, kind of a way of uh, playing against myself. And so I uh, developed this odd penchant for soundscapes, or actually just one soundscape, because it seemed to be the same one each time. And it sounded like a couple of whales mating. So much so that a friend of mine dubbed it the whale-gasm. Now, a few years later, I tried to go back and revisit it and refine it a bit and make it a little more musical, and it never really quite happened. But when I did that, I rechristened it the slightly less dirty Bennytronics after uh, Frippertronics, uh, Robert Fripp's little tape delay feedback loop system. Of which, uh, I guess I should explain that. I can't do real Frippertronics because I would need two reel-to-reel -reel decks. So, in a nutshell, and this is a bit dumbed down, but Frippertronics was one tape recorder recording some guitar stuff, but uh, it wouldn't be taken up by the take-up reel. Instead, the tape would just carry on to another tape deck a couple of feet away, play on that, and then the take-up reel would take up the, the excess tape. And then it would be fed back into the first deck, and it would just kind of swirl around and build and build. And so uh, I'm going to try the next best thing. So uh, obviously I'm cheating already with some of these effects, but I can't really do much else. I just don't have the means. But uh, anyway, the signal flow is a little funky. It's the guitar to the effects to this little mixer, which is, uh, it doesn't have any effects. It's a very basic mixer. It's dry. That will carry on to the reel-to-reel, -reel, which we'll be recording, and in monitor mode, which to my ear will knock things out of sync. And that will be fed out back to the mixer and finally onto the guitar amp, which I've got mic'd up. And I will record it on my little field recorder here. And so uh, also 
in the process. I'll have to uh, play a bit of it later. But this records its own program of sorts. And uh, what I'm going to be doing is just going to be pretty much noise, just freaky noise. But it creates kind of its own program on the reel-to-reel. -reel. And it's a lot drier and it's a lot quieter, but it's still kind of oddball. So, uh, yeah. Now the real trick is to figure out how to do this and actually shoot it. Okay, here we go. Something like that. This book was part of a whole series of how-tos put out by Elliot Rightway Books, LTD. And uh, honestly, some of these look just way too interesting to pass up. So if I can find them, potentially coming soon to an archive near you is the right way to improve your English. I think I need that one. The Encyclopedia of Fads and Fallacies. Things for Boys and Girls to Make and Grow, All About Men, Camping with a Family, Presumably Your Own, The Dairy Farmer's Encyclopedia, Pig Keeping and Breeding. Is that one? Look at the girl. Ooh, the crime uh, must uh, have been hunting him. It's him. Pay the person over, or Father Skelton. One of you, Father keep a sharp look out now. Or Parson. It was a babble of voices. 
Where can I find knees like that?